buffet in the foyer, foyer buffet area right outside those doors and you can bring it back in and eat it at your desk here. Place. Um, our next speaker got a little bit of sleep on the plane coming over here and maybe he'll get some, some more on the cross-country flight back to Connecticut tonight. So be nice to him because he might be a little tired. As are other speakers, he's performed many studies and specializes in exercise, athletic performance, and nutrition. He's a former competitive power lifter and still keeps in shape while on a ketogenic diet. He graciously gives his time to speak at scientific and industrial conferences, and we're honored to have him here today. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jeff Bolek. Uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm actually well rested. I have three boys under the age of six, so I'm on vacation <laughs> right now. But thank you, uh, really a genuine um, uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to share with you some of the research we've done, some of the ideas that I've been thinking about. Really, I, I started uh, uh, being interested in the topic of low carbohydrate diets in the early 90s, so, so two decades ago, and been doing research for about 15 years. Uh, so the first talk I'm giving today uh, is really um, focused around the um, topic of lipoprotein responses to low carb diets and that's uh, you know in colloquial terms that that really means cholesterol metabolism and yeah you know, I guess the bad news is uh, this can get a little tricky um, you know a pretty smart guy Albert Einstein uh, said make things as simple as possible but not simpler and I, I like to abide by that, so it's really easy to, to oversimplify things when they're very complex. But another pretty smart guy, I think it was Winston Churchill, said out of intense complexities, intense simplicities emerge. And so I think there are some themes here and some uh, things you've already heard today about cholesterol that are true. But I also want you to appreciate some of the nuances and some of the individuality when it comes to cholesterol responses because this remains a big barrier for a lot of uh, physicians as well as a lot of people in terms of how their blood lipids and cholesterol responds to this type of diet. And that was really my initial interest in, 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 in sort of getting my uh, feet wet in low carb. My initial interest was in cholesterol metabolism. So all my work through, uh, throughout the 90s and the last decade has focused on cholesterol metabolism. And so I think we've learned a little bit. But this is a pretty uh, common occurrence, and I actually get a lot of emails from people who share their uh, cholesterol numbers. And so this is not an unusual uh, type of email at all, where uh, you have people who, uh, who have a, a, a pretty favorable response in terms of their triglycerides go down. You've heard that. Uh, their HDL goes up, sometimes dramatically you will find quite often that the total cholesterol goes up, sometimes quite markedly, as you can see here. Now this is quite alarming for many people. And of course the LDL goes up at well. And, and so the, 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 you sort of get a panic type email. What, what does this mean? Uh, should I be concerned about this? And so I, in my talk I wanted to um, uh, basically ad ad answer this question. I mean, should we be concerned and how would you interpret this? So I want to ask the question, how does a low-carb diet, first of all, affect cholesterol responses? In particular, focusing on the LDL, but we'll also talk about some of the other biomarkers because it's, it's never good to really be too myopic and think only about one biomarker. We, we've heard in, in pretty much all the talks so far that there is no one biomarker. In fact, inflammation is probably more important than cholesterol, uh, as you just heard about. And once we sort of understand what the typical LDL response is, um, the next question is, should we, you know, should we be concerned with that? So I, I wrote a review paper, I think this was almost a decade ago, in 2005. Wow, it's hard to believe that's a decade ago. But what we did was look at uh, about 15 different studies that all compared directly low-carb to low-fat diet. 
and looked at the change, this is the percent change in total cholesterol, let's just focus here. And each set of circles and triangles is one study. So the circles are the low carb response, the triangles are the low fat response. And, and the, the main point here is that in all of these studies, the low fat diet results in a greater reduction in total cholesterol than a low carb diet. Triglycerides, just the opposite. A low carb diet every time beats a low fat diet on average. HDL, uh, that's the good cholesterol, cardioprotective, uh, every time low carb beats low fat. You get a greater increase in HDL. LDL, same as total. The low fat diet, it's better at lowering LDL cholesterol. Total concentration of LDL cholesterol. But let's look a little closer. Uh, we do pretty rigorously controlled studies and we, uh, we go to great lengths to try to control uh, various confounding factors around cholesterol to the extent we actually measure it twice. We have people come back on two different days, we make sure they're fasted and we control for exercise and caffeine and alcohol. And even under those types of well controlled conditions, when we measure cholesterol responses to a low carb diet, Here's a bunch of individual responses. That's what we get. So just about, you may as well flip a coin if you ask yourself, how's your cholesterol going to respond? Because that's about as good as you can predict it. So the average, you know, if we look at mean response is, is about zero, but with, we have, you know, pretty much a bell curve here. So you, you, you could have increased by 50 points or you could have decreased by 50 points uh, at the uh, tail ends of that distribution. Now if you look at another marker here, triglycerides, um, it's still variable, but almost everyone we've ever studied, which is approaching probably a thousand different patient lipid pairs we have now, almost everyone decreases their triglycerides. I mean, the few people we've ever seen it go up in started extremely low. So they were at 35 milligrams per deciliter and it went up to 38. Um, so this is a, a very profound response. I mean, this is a drug-like. In fact, this is better than drug-like. There's no drug on the market that lowers triglyceride this consistently and this uniformly. And it seems the higher you start, the greater the reduction. So this is a very potent tool for lowering triglyceride. But the LDL response is quite variable. Now we've, uh, we've done both free living but highly, um, uh, they're, they're intensive in terms of being uh, you know, a lot of counseling, a lot of intensive time spent on making sure that people are actually doing what you're saying. But we've also done feeding studies where we actually prepare all the food and control the food intake. They're almost metabolic ward type studies, although they're not locked up. But we do to go to great lengths to control exactly what people are consuming. And even when you look at those studies, where uh, a group of people are all consuming the exact same food, this is the response in LDL cholesterol. And this is under um, both weight loss and weight maintenance conditions. But it's quite variable. We're all different in terms of our cholesterol response. Actually, in terms of almost any marker you look at, there's a lot of variability in how people respond. But in particular with LDL cholesterol. So we've got one guy. I mean, this guy is pretty concerned. He, he had a 75, 80 milligram per deciliter increase. We had this exact same diet. Somebody dropped their LDL 50 points. So should we be concerned with this? Um, uh, we've already heard a little bit about um, this, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's worth um, emphasizing uh, the question, is LDL cholesterol a good marker of heart disease or other disease or, 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 or death? Uh, do you have an increased risk of mortality if your LDL goes up? And I think the, the answer is it's not as good as maybe it's made out to be or the drug companies would like you to believe. Uh, Dr. Finney mentioned the Leon diet heart study and uh, I'm not sure he mentioned the cholesterol responses but in, in this study uh, there was a, a dramatic reduction in uh, mortality but it was disassociated from the cholesterol response. 
So uh, the reduction in cholesterol was not the explanation. And as we probably know, it was more related to the anti-inflammatory effects of the Mediterranean diet. And then it was also mentioned the Women's Health Initiative study, which was a half a billion dollar uh, study that uh, looked at a um, low-fat diet in postmenopausal women. And actually the diet was effective at lowering cholesterol over an eight-year period, but had absolutely no effect on heart disease, cancer, or type 2 diabetes. So here again, you know, evidence that prospectively changes in LDL cholesterol are, are not correlated to heart outcomes. And as we know, the story is much more complex. Um, there's other biomarkers that may be better, or are probably better, and there is probably no one biomarker that's entirely predictive. And when we look at this from a broad spectrum perspective, um, we see that a low carb diet improves biomarkers of various diseases uh, better than a low fat diet across the board. This is a 12 week study we did comparing a, a very low carb ketogenic diet to a traditional low fat diet in patients with metabolic syndrome. Well controlled 12 week study. We measured a whole bunch of things. And across the board, the red here, low carb, they lost more weight, they lost more fat by DEXA, and they lost more fat particularly in their midsection. Look at the triglyceride reduction, 50% reduction in triglycerides. We even fed people a high fat meal and measured their triglyceride responses to that meal. And you get a 50% reduction in the postprandial triglyceride response, which uh, several lines of evidence are suggesting is, is a very uh, good indicator of your risk for heart disease. So you're becoming very efficient at processing the fat that you're eating. Look at the HDL increase, about a 10 to 15 percent increase in HDL. That's very impressive. Again, that rivals any drug on the market right now. HDL can be a very stubborn particle to, to change and it's better than any drug or lifestyle that's often discussed. I mean you hear about fish oil or smoking cessation. Uh, or even weight loss. The effects on HDL are pretty mixed and mild, um, whereas low carb is pretty consistent in raising the HDL cholesterol. I'll come back to this a little later, but the triglyceride to HDL ratio is uh, uh, believed to be a pretty good uh, ratio uh, uh, or indicator of, of risk for heart disease. You obviously get a big improvement there. Uh, in, into some of the more uh, sophisticated uh, uh, parts of lipoprotein metabolism, you can begin to look at the protein part, not just the cholesterol part, and ApoB is a, uh, many believe, a better indicator of heart disease than LDL cholesterol. That goes down. Uh, ApoA1 is more associated with the HDL particle, and that ratio of ApoB to A1 improves. We'll get into this qualitative versus quantitative issue of cholesterol, but for now, the small LDLs go down. Markers of insulin resistance, glucose, insulin go down, leptin goes down. We talked about leptin resistance. Uh, we view this as uh, uh, indicating an improvement in leptin sensitivity. And actually the saturated fat in your blood goes down. And that's what's important. It's not the dietary saturated fat that's linked to heart disease as Dr. Wartman uh, very um, eloquently told you. But saturated fat is correlated to heart disease when you measure it in a person's body. So it's, it's the saturated fat that's stored that's either circulating in, in various lipid fractions or stored in your various membranes. That is associated with heart disease. And we've measured now saturated fat in people on low carb diets who are often consuming two to three times the level of saturated fat and we show it actually goes down. So you are, you are not what you eat, you are what you save from what you eat. And when you're on a low carb diet, you're switching your metabolism to burning fat and that, and that, is, uh, and that includes saturated fat. 
So when we say LDL cholesterol, uh, you know, you, you get your blood draw and you send it off to the clinical lab and you get your numbers back. What you're actually getting is, is a cholesterol concentration. It's not even a direct measurement, well, which I'll come back to. But uh, uh, that's looking at LDL, total, total LDL cholesterol concentration. And it turns out when you measure... Uh, when you look a little deeper into lipoprotein metabolism, that LDL cholesterol, just that, that fraction alone, is a very heterogeneic population, meaning there are different types of LDL cholesterol. Uh, one way to, to distinguish these different types is by size. So you have smaller particles, you have larger particles, you have medium-sized particles. And there's various ways to, to do, measure these, all of them fairly sophisticated, so they're not routinely done. But a, a, a lot of evidence suggests that it's the smaller particles, the smaller LDL particles, that are most atherogenic and most highly associated with heart disease. Part of the reason is they can penetrate the arterial wall easier because they're smaller. They also are more prone to oxidative stress. Uh, and they have a longer residence time in the circulation, so they just they, they hang out longer than other particles. And so we've measured this in many studies now, and it's really one of the most consistent responses. So whereas I just showed you this variability in LDL cholesterol response, half people go up, half go down, almost everybody decreases their LD, small LDL cholesterol. So. Uh, High carbohydrate, low fat diet pushes this, the, uh, the, uh, the particle distribution to a smaller uh, a predominance of the smaller particles. And a low carb, high fat diet pushes it in the other direction. So you actually get rid of the small particles and you have more of these fluffy, larger LDL particles, which are not as atherogenic. And this is just. Uh, some data. Uh, so these are the individual responses in LDL cholesterol to a low carb diet. So you see, it's kind of all over the place. Some go down, some go up. But here's the particle size, LDL1. These are the large ones. Suddenly there's not so much variability. Everybody goes up. Here's the smaller ones. Again, very consistent. Almost everybody goes down. So this is this is intimately linked to the triglyceride response, and I won't go into the metabolism, but when triglycerides go down, you promote a lipoprotein profile associated with less small LDL. So they're intimately linked. And Ron Krauss has, I think, published some really compelling data here, as was mentioned earlier. He's kind of the person that's credited with identifying particle sizes being important and also developing some of the methodologies for measuring LDL particle size. But this is work from his group. Each one of these points is a different study that, uh, that included a diet that had a different level of carbohydrate in it. And this is the prevalence of pattern B. Pattern B is the uh, um, unhealthy profile where you have more of the small particles. So uh, when you look at this graph, this is the percent carbohydrate in the diet versus the percent of the population or cohort being studied that had pattern B. And look at how nicely those dots line up on that line. That's pretty incredible. Our studies would actually fit in down here on the lower carb end, and we see that pattern B very consistently disappears in people. So it's consistent with his work at higher carbohydrate intakes. As I was saying, there's various ways to measure this. If you're really interested in knowing what your particle size distribution looks like, um, Typically, uh, or historically, the, the gold standard was to do this using gel electrophoresis, where you put your blood sample into a, a gel and let the smaller particles migrate further through that gel, and you can stain them and quantify them that way. Um, a more popular uh, method now is using nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, and that's done commercially by a company um, called LipoScience. Uh, and so th your physician can pretty easily send a sample there and they can report back using um, that technology, which actually gives you HDL 
and VLDL particle size as well. Uh, there's ultra centrifugation techniques. Uh, a company called Athrotech uses that. Uh, a newer method developed by Ron Krauss is ion mobility. I'm not sure if that's commercially available yet. But a, um, a pretty good estimate of particle size can be determined by simply looking at your triglyceride to HDL ratio, which of course is available from a routine lipid test. And, uh, and so a, a triglyceride to HDL ratio uh, greater than 3.5 a lower value is better. So a greater than 3.5 would indicate you likely have the pattern B or a predominance of the smaller LDL particles. So I guess a, you know, one point here is that even if your LDL cholesterol goes up, it goes up substantially, it's very likely that your HDL went up too. And, and, and probably balanced it out in terms of a ratio. But it's also quite po probable that uh, your particle size increased and that your small LDL particles actually went down even though your total LDL cholesterol concentration went up. And those are two non-trivial uh, effects that I, I think will impact ultimate risk. Another uh, sort of nuance to all this is that there does appear to be a, a sort of a temporal response here in cholesterol. So it may depend on when you get your cholesterol measurements done in the time course of your low carb diet. So uh, in one of the first studies we did, uh, we did biweekly measurements of cholesterol, duplicate measures on different days, well controlled. And we see that on average, and this was a weight maintenance, so there wasn't a, a, a large weight loss here, that LDL on average uh, increased. Uh, and it seemed to peak about four weeks, and then it did start to come down by eight weeks. And, and Dr. Finney um, published this paper uh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, uh, showing uh, 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 over a longer time period, there's a distinct temporal pattern of LDL cholesterol response uh, in individuals undergoing major weight loss. So these, um, these were morbidly obese individuals who lost a uh, large amount of weight over a, uh, a period of several months. And during that first two months, they observed uh, 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 a significant reduction in cholesterol. As weight loss continued, um, each subject uh, saw a rebound in their cholesterol. And then as they entered into weight maintenance, it tended to come back down. And it, interestingly, in, the, in this study, Steve, uh, Steve did adipose biopsies in three different locations. Um, and measured the cholesterol and the triglyceride levels in those adipose tissue samples and, sh and basically um, found that the reason for this transient hypercholesterolemia uh, was because it was being mobilized from fat stores. And over time, as, as these individuals um, entered into weight maintenance, that cholesterol got metabolized. And that type of um, you know, entry of cholesterol into the circulation is, is, is primarily associated, at least the, the theory is, with the LDL particle, but it's likely not an atherogenic type of response. And eventually the body processes that and reaches a new homeostasis. So you could see, you know, depending on when you measure cholesterol here, that there could be, you could be anywhere in that type of cyclic uh, response. And a lot of this hypercholesterolemia could be just due to um, efflux out of, the, out of the fat cell. And finally, uh, you might be surprised to learn that, again, when you read your LDL numbers off of a lipid test, chances are, uh, high chances are, that it's not actually measured directly. That when we measure um, LDL cholesterol, it's a calculated number. So it's derived from an equation. So what usually happens is you send your, your blood off to the lab, they'll measure total cholesterol from that sample, and they'll measure the HDL and the triglycerides, 
and they calculate the LDL from this formula. It's called the Friedwald formula. And it's thought to be pretty accurate. Um, but it's well known that when your triglycerides are high, uh, that the formula is not accurate. And part of the reason is the assumption here is that you know, the, t the total cholesterol is the LDL plus the HDL plus whatever cholesterol is in the VLDL portion, which is the triglyceride here, and that there's a constant ratio of triglyceride to cholesterol in this VLDL fraction. And it's that assumption that we know is not correct when triglycerides are high, but there's compelling evidence that it's not accurate when triglycerides are low either, which is more the scenario on a low-carb diet. And so you can find some, um, some papers on this and that have calculated LD, uh, LDL in individuals who had major reductions in triglycerides and then compared that to a direct quantitative me measure of LDL cholesterol. And the calculated value overestimates the triglyceride or the LDL cholesterol. And that may not be insignificant. So Perhaps some of this elevation in some people is just due to an artifact of the equation and not really attributed to a real uh, increase in LDL cholesterol. So I think in interpreting LDL cholesterol, it's, you know, we can't get too hung up on that single measurement um, that we need to look, look a little deeper and, and, and broader at the, at the whole metabolic you know, situation going on. So looking at inflammatory markers. If your inflammatory markers are improving, your HDL's going up, your triglycerides are going down, your particle size is increasing, and yet your total LDL cholesterol goes up, should you be concerned? I'd say probably not. And, and a person's feeling well and they're energetic, uh, that that's probably just their new, new, new homeostasis in terms of their cholesterol readings and that's not associated with an atherogenic uh, profile. So with that, that's all I have. I know everybody's hungry for lunch, but I will very um, gladly entertain any questions. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I, I noticed in one of your slides, um, um, try to the right to the zero ratio. Uh, greater than 3.5 may be uh, an indication of insulin resistance also? Yes. So, mm -hmm. is, is there a number for this ratio where like um, that indicates uh, what is not insulin resistant? Well, that, 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 that uh, it's a good question and I think, you know, people propose various cutoffs or thresholds for triglyceride to HDL or even HOMA scores, which is another more common indicator of insulin resistance, which uh, includes the fasting insulin and glucose level. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to defend a, a, you know, an arbitrary threshold because this is a continuum. And not only is it a continuum, um, it's, you could have varying levels of insulin resistance in different tissues. So, you know, you've got insulin resistance going on in muscle, perhaps liver, perhaps fat cells, even brain. Uh, and so, even within a tissue, you may have s s specific signaling pathways involved with insulin that are insulin, res you know, insulin resistant, other pathways that are completely normal. So I always, you know, it's a little hard to say that, you know, if you're above this threshold, you have insulin resistance. If you're below it, you don't. Um, because that, that's sort of a moving target, depending on the person. But that's been put out there as, as a threshold, you know, uh, as a way to categorize people as insulin resistant or non-insulin resistant. Uh, if you used a different marker, you might get slightly different results. But I think the point is, if within a person, if it's going down, you're probably improving your level of insulin resistance. And if it's going in the opposite direction, just the opposite. Yes? Could you comment a little bit on LDLP as a risk factor? Uh, LDL particle concentration? That yeah, well, that's, um, that's, a, that's a, a measure that's provided off the NMR. And uh, it's a little hard to 
understand this because it's, it's not measuring cholesterol concentration, but you're actually measuring the concentration of particles because that's what the NMR is really able to determine. Um, and, you know, according to some of the studies that have looked at particle concentration versus cholesterol concentration, there's some evidence that it might be uh, a better predictor of heart disease. There's the, the one study that's cited a lot is, is, a, is a, an examination of the Framingham study where they looked at the traditional LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol markers versus the LDL particle concentration from NMR and they showed that the particle concentration was a better predictor of heart disease. So I think it, there's some evidence that, uh, that, it, that it does provide some information about your risk what they don't have is the prospective studies, so they just sort of have those epidemiological associations. Um, I haven't seen a good long-term prospective study that shows that marker correlates with heart disease, but liposcience is pushing this as a better indicator, a more sensitive indicator of heart disease than traditional cholesterol measures. People at the desk, at the at the tables back in the back, uh, they have uh, lots more information. Actually, I need to